Welcome, everybody. My name is Adam. I'm an adult services librarian here at Height. I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Tara Byrne, who's going to talk to us about why adults should read children's picture books. Dr. Byrne, thank you. The floor so is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Adam, and thank you all so much for being here on a cold Monday night when it's dark outside. I really appreciate it, and I hope that you walk away with some good books to check out and some reasons why, even if you're not buying a picture book for a child, it's worth reading them yourself. Uh, but I couldn't. Uh, before I get started, though, I do want to thank the Noble Library in particular. Um, I've lived in the Noble neighborhood for the last 13 years, and I'm so, so grateful to, to the library. And Adam, thank you so much for inviting me and for being a lifesaver when my students have very difficult research projects. Um, he's been a great guy. And also my family. Um, my kids have really grown up in the children's room downstairs. And yes, yeah, <laughs> the wonderful librarian here. And I've met some wonderful friends down there as well. Um, so I just before I get started, so much of my own work as a, as a scholar and a researcher and a teacher and as a mom has been informed by this lovely library. So wonderful. Thank them for all of that. Um, so that the volume work? Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm going to divide tonight's talk into four parts. First, how did I get here? Um, I have a career where I teach picture books to reluctant adult readers. That's pretty much my job at Case Western Reserve University. So I'm going to talk about how I kind of went from Shakespeare to Dr. Seuss. I'm going to talk about some famous titles that you probably recognize, some Good Night Moon to the Snowy Day. And then I'm going to talk about some new books, um, ones that break boundaries and are really wonderful titles that my students love to talk about. And then finally, I'll make some of my, my last um, my last arguments as to why we should all read children's picture books and answer questions that you might have. So I want to kind of start where this all began, um, how I got here, um, with where I was in 2008, which was, you know, grainy old pictures, but I was teaching ninth grade English. Um, I went to Bowling Green State University thinking I would be a high school English teacher because I love reading novels and plays and poetry, and I thought... That's what I would do for the rest of my career. So I started my teaching career working um, with a special program at public school, with, specifically with Atlas Education. And I remember my very first day walking into the classroom. I had a 15-year-old freshman walk up to me and say, hey, Ms. Hansen, no English teacher has ever gotten me to read a book cover to cover, and you're not going to be the first. <laughs> so I knew I had my work cut out for me. I was faced with very hesitant readers and writers who were also going through some substantial life issues. Um, some were in the foster care system. So, um, you know, they're just facing a lot. So... This was what I was expected to teach, the classics. My principal gave me a list and said, you're going to take these 90 students who very confidently did not want to read, and you are going to read with them. <laughs> Jane Eyre, Great Expectations, The Giver, which is a young adult classic, and our big book of the year, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And I looked at my readers and I, you know, tried everything I could as a new and very fledgling teacher. I tried to find exciting ways to get them to pair up. I brought in music and songs and, and I did my best. But when we got to Romeo and Juliet, I remember the students <laughs> opening up the first page, looking down at the words and the language, you know, uh, organized in a way they've never seen before and just confidently closing the book and looking at me like, what are we doing? But I was also, as I was teaching high school, I was also in English courses working on a BA in English, and I took a uh, English course called Shakespeare Adaptation. So it was from Dr. Stephanie Gerhardt, and it helped me look at Shakespeare and how contemporary writers and filmmakers and artists and um, composers took Shakespeare's plays and were inspired to create works of art in, in the 20th century. 
And so I thought about how do I bring in some of these adaptations? Not necessarily as a replacement. We needed to read the play. We acted out in class. We did our best. But instead, to excite the students. And so I thought about movies with the Bob Lerman, Romeo plus Juliet adaptation. I thought about artwork. There's plenty of very dramatic classical pieces that feature Romeo and Juliet. But as I was looking through, I found a more surprising avenue, and that is children's picture books based on Romeo and Juliet. And some of these books, um, for instance, Michael Rosen and Jane Ray book, keeps most of the play, although adapts it into prose form, and shows the story in really beautiful and dramatic art. Some of the adaptations, like Romeo and Juliet, reimagine Shakespeare's play entirely. And unlike the, the tragic um, play that Shakespeare produced, no one died. However, a dog plays dead. So that's the big dramatic thing. Um, or books like Romeo and Juliet, a uh, uh, counting primer, simply take elements like roses and friends and count them throughout the book. So with my students, we looked at these books, and I didn't assign them because I thought this is the level that they were at. They needed a picture book because they couldn't read anything more. Instead, we used this as a place to compare, to think about the differences. What does it mean that we have baby board books based on Romeo and Juliet? What does it mean when we have an edition where nobody dies and the fighting is all just kind of, you know, words back and forth and nobody gets hurt? What impact does it have on the themes and the messages and the symbolism and what can we learn from it? So kind of my first reason why I think adults should read children's picture books is it sometimes gives us a new frame of reference or a way to look at classics in a totally new light. And again, not as a way to replace or think about something that we could you know, teach instead, but instead of a really thoughtful place of comparison. What does it tell us about us that we emphasize certain themes or artistic styles versus others? So I started here thinking I was going to be an English teacher, but I had several English teachers that kind of pushed me to graduate school. They said, no, you seem really interested in, in writing and reading and researching. Why don't, you, why don't you consider a different path? And to be honest, as much as I love teaching high school, I was a little bit burnt out by that first year. Um, I tried lots of new things, but I carried it with me. And so I thought, you know, in order to be a better teacher to my students, maybe I should go back to school and spend a little bit more time reading. So that's what I did. And so that led me to Case Western Reserve University, where I thought I was going to be a Shakespeare scholar. I was thoroughly uh, you know, excited by the work that I had done with Shakespeare, and I thought that's the direction I was going to continue in. And while I did take courses on Shakespeare, I also took courses on American literature in the city. And that's where I found poet Gwendolyn Brooks. So early on in graduate school, I started reading her poetry, talking about it with other graduate students, and I, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to research her work. I was a little familiar with her because when I was teaching high school, one of the assigned poems that we read is her canonical poem, We Real Cool. And so I, I knew a bit of her work, but through my graduate work, I read Annie Allen in the Mecca and Street on Bronzeville. And as I was like an early master's student, I was in the library trying to figure out, I want to learn more about her and specifically why she so often chooses child characters. Uh, she, she often writes her poetry from the point of view of a child. Um, and so I'm interested in looking at that more. So I'm in the library at Case, and I'm looking at all of the, the volumes of her poetry, all the critical work, and I see a very slender book. And so I pick it off the shelf, and what I find is her picture book. So Gwendolyn Brooks wrote several picture books during her career, starting with Bronzeville, Boys, and Girls. And like A Street in Bronzeville, this book also imagines a street in Chicago, also brings in child characters, but this book is specifically written for kids. 
And I was so amazed how she, you know, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, like one of the most influential voices of the 20th century in poetry, also took time to write a children's picture book. Um, and this is, while this version was published um, in 1946, I believe, it was readapted by Faith Ringwald. Years, I think this one's from 2006. Um, and it, it, again, just was a really important work in her canon. And so I wondered at that point, wow, like if Gwendolyn Brooks wrote a children's picture book, were there other influential writers that I'm reading who also did? And very quickly, <laughs> yes, there are many, many writers that we might be familiar with for as adult readers who also found that children's picture books was a really important site to similarly share poetry, messages, and themes, and to empower youth. Um, and so I very quickly realized that maybe Shakespeare wasn't the focus for me, and maybe instead I wanted to dive deeper into these children's picture books, because as I was reading, I realized that there was a, a gap in the scholarship. Some people would cite them casually, but I didn't notice them that much. Um, and so I found works like W.E.B. Du Bois and Jesse Fawcett edited a children's magazine for two years in 1920 and 1921 called The Brownies Book. In this book, they collected stories of children, photographs, poetry, short stories, and wrote to the children of the sun. Um, Langston Hughes, who we know as a uh, uh, lived in Cleveland for a time as well, he wrote many picture books during his career. He started with some nonfiction works, including First Book of Jazz and other books with notable African American figures. And the last book that was published right after he died was actually a children's picture book called Born and Raised. Published in 1969, this is a satire. Um, there was another book published by Suzanne Heller a year before called Misery. And in Suzanne Heller's work, she imagines everyday miseries of kids like they're trick-or-treating at Halloween, but it's cold outside, so you have to wear coats and cover your Halloween costume. Or you're wearing overalls and go to the bathroom, and the overall strap gets in the toilet. Susan <laughs> <laughs> Heller's miseries are absolutely a good one. <laughs> they're silly, they're everyday. But Langston Hughes saw this, and again, all the illustrations in misery, or in misery are of white children, and Langston Hughes thought, well, what about the contemporary miseries of black children, including discrimination, including not being able to swim in a pool or use a drinking fountain because of the color of their skin? So Langston Hughes, again, the last book that he published was this children's picture book that was making a really important message about what black children face. Um, similarly, James Baldwin wrote Little Man, Little Man, A Story of Childhood. This book is a little bit longer and a little bit more imaginative. Um, some people might talk about this more in terms of like a young adult, almost like a graphic novel for, for older readers. Um, this also imagines a young boy named PJ, and he um, lives day to day in the street. Um, I also um, note found Alice Walker. There's a flower that took my nose smelling me. Alice Walker is still writing picture books. She published one, I think, a couple of months ago. Um, and Toni Morrison, in collaboration with her son, Clay, also has published a number of children's picture books. One called Please Louise, where a little girl is in the library. It's a great book to honor and celebrate libraries. Um, as well as a series of books that kind of reimagine Aesop's fables. But the one book that I almost always recommend to adults or um, <clears throat> teach in my own classes is this book. It's called The Big Box. Um, when Toni Morrison wrote this book, she was inspired by something that happened to Slade when he was a young boy. So Slade came home from school one day and explained to his mom that he had to sit out in the hallway. And she said, why? He said, well, I was goofing off and my teacher, you know, pulled me aside and said, you can't, you can't sit in the classroom anymore because you can't handle your seat on. That stuck <laughs> with Toni Morrison, and she thought about that. What does that mean? To tell my son, to tell a child that you can't be in the classroom and learn because you can't handle your freedom. 
And so she first wrote a poem titled The Big Box for Ms. Magazine, where it was first published in their pity corner. They actually had a, a separate part of Ms. Magazine um, dedicated to um, to children and children's issues, but then it was later reimagined in this picture book. And the picture book tells the story of three children. Each um, are punished for either not being able to sit, sit still in class, or chasing after dogs in the field, or or just being bambunctious. Um, one child is reprimanded by her teachers, another child his neighbors, and the last by her family. And all of the children are placed in a big box. And here we'll see. Okay, here's where they're free. Reprimanded. Um, placed in a box. The box has three locks on the door, and it's filled with candy and treats and plastic fish in a bowl, but the children are told that they're quicker because they can't handle their freedom. This is a book that I love to read with my students because as adult readers, it, it, it poses a really important question. When do we punish versus protect children? And how do we know the difference? And Toni Morrison doesn't make us it easy for us to think about that because in showing these children that get lots of treats that are always confined to one setting, we can think about how much, how much, you know, how much do we give children the ability to have agency and to explore the world around them? And so again, we have all of these great writers, again, Hughes and W.E.D. Du Bois, James Baldwin, who are probably quite familiar with as writers for adults, but they too found children's literature as a really important site to share messages. And so another reason why adults should read children's literature is because so many influential adult writers also found it as an important place to share messages. I have a question. I just thought, who is the, uh, I'm the late. Right. Yeah, who is she? This is Jesse Fawcett. So oh, Jessie, I thought it was County Cullen. Oh, no, no. Um, right. Jesse Fawcett is a co editor okay. of the Brown book. Um, oh, and, and w. oh, that I recognize. Yeah. And this lady here in the. Alice Walker. And that's Maya Angelou. Um, this is Tony Moore. Oh, pardon me. I yeah. thought that was one. Maya Angelou also wrote. Yeah, pictures. I was going to ask you about that. I'll be happy to talk more with the two women. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I studied these books, I wrote a dissertation, and that's led me to where I've been for the last seven years. I teach writing at Case Western Reserve University, mostly the first and second year students. And in this program, I teach topic-led writing courses. What that means is I help my students research and kind of learn foundational writing skills, but with a tough theme. Some of my brilliant coworkers have courses on medieval robots or the biology of sleep. Uh, my courses are always picture book courses. And so what that means is that every day, including this morning, my students, 20 students and I, gather around the table and we talk about children's literature. Now, what's unique about this is none of my students are preparing for fields where they're going to be librarians or teaching children. Case does not have an education school. So all of the students in my class are future accountants, future physicians, future aerospace engineer. I have four aerospace engineer majors in one of my classes right now. Um, and what is so exciting about that is none of them enter my classroom thinking, I'm looking at these picture books for practical reasons. How am I going to teach them in a classroom setting? Or what's best for children right now? They're there. Partially because they thought it was going to be the easiest writing class they could sign up for. Again, I work with a lot of hesitant readers. I work with some really brilliant students who love math and science, and English was always at the bottom of the list of, of classes to take. Um, but that has really posed a really exciting challenge for the last seven years because I get to ask, you know, engage students in books that excite them as adults. And I found that this is also a really wonderful place to take on some tough questions. A number of the picture books that I'm going to talk about today 
don't stray from entering into some dark, difficult topics, whether it be war or death, poverty or racism. Um, I also work uh, as a faculty associate for the Schubert Center for Child Studies. This is an interdisciplinary group on campus that brings together sociologists, psychologists, uh, and physicians. I work with quite a bit, uh, quite a few pediatricians, and we come together because we all have research that has to do with childhood or children. And so, because of this, it has uh, led led me to thinking about the practical uh, ways and applications that we can use children's literature, and also has led me to opportunities like being on a panel with Joy Bostic and LeVar Burton, thinking about the power of children's literature you know, beyond the classroom as well. And so some of my courses, again, focus on radical picture books. Um, I teach an entire course on narratives of immigration. So all of the picture books that we study are specifically thinking about migration. I have a whole pile that I'll recommend um, based on teaching this course. And every semester, my students and I read about 80 picture books, all with different topics. So because of that, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of their favorites. Um, well, I just have a question because we featured them. We focused on African American writers, adult writers who wrote picture books, nothing to say about, you know, non uh, what, white okay. writers who yeah. write, you know. So who, Sylvia Plath, William Faulkner, um, there are a lot of, um, yeah, Brittany yeah. Umergar, who is actually a, or a Cleveland Heights author, who's written a number of novels, has also written three picture books. So there are, there are a number of, of writers uh, who find this. I, I wrote a dissertation and I specifically looked at African American writers because of something I'll talk about later, which is using picture books as a site of representational justice. So a way in which to to change the narrative. And also, yeah, so I'll get back to that and kind of why there's that book. Um, but one of the things that I also do in the class is help my students take a look at classics in a new way. Um, some of my students have never read children's picture books. Uh, some of them come from backgrounds or even countries where storytelling and, and reading took different forms than something like this. It's funny, spread, you know, highly art, like artistic children's picture book. Um, but I, I want them to immerse themselves in some of the still bestsellers. And so most of my classes start with this classic, Good Night Moon. Published many, many years ago by Margaret Y. Brown and Clement Heard, this remains on top 10 list and bestseller list to this day, even though it was published, my goodness, we're getting close to the 100 year. Well, we're not too far away from its 100 year anniversary. And when I start my class, you know, I tell my students that we're going to be diving into difficult issues and, uh, you know, we're going to start with this heavy hitter, Good Night Moon. And they all laugh, right? Because they also just came out of OK. They also just got a really tough math class. They're like, whew, good night, man. All right, we're in. Um, but I have them read the story aloud, and I read just as you might in story time, um, slowly, page by page. And I ask them two questions to center them. What do you wonder, and what do you notice? And these questions help maybe work beyond the, oh, okay, you know, we're just going to sleep. So then thinking about some of the really curious elements of Good Night Moon, like why do we go from this really bright green and orange color palette to gray, to colorful, to grayscale? Why do we focus on certain images like a cow jumping over a moon? Why do we say good night to nobody at one point in this class? It helps them think about the bunny, think about the little old lady, which they're like, it's not the lady, it's the rabbit in a rocking chair. <laughs> there's a lot to talk about there. When doing a deep dive and really slowing down and looking at the images, it can help them notice some of the oddity of this beloved classic and also make them wonder why 
Why did she make some of these decisions in the past, and why did Clement Hood write it this way? And then I get to do one of my favorite things, which is introduce them to Margaret Wise Brown, who is a fascinating figure. She died relatively young after a freak accident, after a surgery, um, but even in her lifetime, she published over 50 children's pictures of um, including titles that you might be familiar with, like Home for Bunny or Little Fur Family, or maybe titles you might be less familiar with, like The Little Shy or The Shy Little Horse. Um, when she lived, she was really notorious for saying the following about kids. She said, well, I don't especially like children, at least not as a group. I won't let anybody get away with anything just because he's little. Margaret Wise Brown was a really interesting figure because she did not come into children's literature because she wanted to provide a comforting or entertaining story to children. Instead, she was really interested about the science of how kids learn and how kids work. She worked with a group of educators called the Bank Street Group, a group of early childhood development psychologists and educators who were really interested in providing books that did something new or different. And so when she was writing Good Night Women, it was a bit of a social experiment. Could she pen a book that helped children go to sleep? And so some of the curious elements in this book, like the really bright color scheme and then the dull gray tone, is a way to excite and then tire the eye. In reading the book, the goal is to tire children as they're looking at these pictures. There's also the reoccurrence of hush tone, like mush, hush, shh, like throughout the book. And that is supposed to mimic which we hear, but it's also supposed to mimic the sound heard in the womb, a constant sound, which is supposed to remind children of a womb-like woomby state. She tried all of these different things in this curious book, and what she found was groundbreaking success. Parents love to read this book, and to this day, it remains on top 10 lists of bestsellers. You go to Amazon, you will see this book in the top selling picture book. However, um, and oh, and I wanted to mention this really quickly. This is a beautiful biography told in a children's picture book about Margaret Wise Brown. Again, as I said, she's a very wonderful and unique woman um, who just went to the beat of her own drum. And this book was a marvelous job telling her story. Um, but even though she was, you know, found wild success with this book, you know, years after it was published and to this day, it's curious that when the New York Public Library had its 125th anniversary and collected the 10 most checked out books, we see a lot of children's picture books, right? We see The Cat in the Hat, The Snow Day, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. But what's missing here was Good Night Moon. New York City Public Library noted that too and gave it an honorable mention. Why did they do that? Well, it was, this book was published in 1947, but it was not available on the shelves of the New York City Public Library until 1972. Why? Ann Carol Moore. Um, but she detested this book. She thought it was rubbish. She loved stories of children on the countryside and lovely tales. And to her, there was nothing lovely about this. She thought it was inappropriate to be on the shelves of the library. And because of that, till 1972, it was not there. And so this is also a reason why adults should read children's picture books. If you listen to the news, you've probably heard of censorship happening in school library systems. Um, lots of places. So in order to be informed, I think it's important to read some of these books that are in the conversation. What about them is controversial? How are these authors showing uh, you know, differences or finding new ways to tell stories in children's picture books? In 1947, Good Night Moon was radical and different and trying something new. And even though it was a bestseller, it was kept from children as well. Um, but even though, oh, yeah. 
Sorry if I'm interrupting, but I just read a book about E.B. White writing Charlotte's Web. Mm. And I believe that is the same librarian who can Stuart Little first in 1945, I want to say, and then um, she didn't much care for Charlotte's Web in 1960. I would not be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always like to think of, so while Anne Carol Moore has this reputation of kind of, you know, making some poor choices in terms of some really canonical work, there was another editor, her name was Ursula Nordstrom, and she was a defining voice and and really helped the careers of a number of people, including Marie Sendak, um, who wrote Where the Wild Things Are, and um, Margaret White Brown. She really believed in what they were doing. So every time I think of Anne Carol Moore, I'm like, we have to Ursula Nordstrom in this conversation. Because there were people who, who did see the value and the beauty in taking the genre in different places. She published Oh, yes. Yep, there you go. <laughs> um, so The Cat in the Hat is number two on the list of most checked out books. And this is a book that I also love to reread with my students because they're likely familiar with the hat and the story. Um, but rereading it and looking at it closely brings to life maybe things that my students haven't seen. Wasn't well, there some controversy about Dr. Street? Uh, saying, I don't know, the imagery that he was using, and I don't know, was it like a fan book, or they were almost made it to the fan book? Why, yeah. why, why, why was that? Oh, we can talk more about that. I, I'm gonna I am aware really of that. Briefly, yeah. um, about his legacy. So, Dr. Dr. Mm -hmm. Seuss, also known as uh, his name, Theodore Geisel, mm -hmm. wrote, like Margaret Wise Brown, over 40 books during his <clears> career, <throat> and also when he started writing books, he was trying to do something new. He's saw early readers um, that were just not exciting kids. There was a big um, controversy during the time he was writing uh, called Why Can't John Read? And so many mm -hmm. teachers are trying to figure out why are we so behind in, in literacy rates and, and getting kids excited to read. So Theodore Geisel will decide to take on the challenge. Okay, how do I take sight words, which are those little words you have to memorize because you can't sound it out like the, right? If you try to sound out the, you're going to be in a mess of trouble. But he knew that those are the words that are foundational, the kind teachers really need to teach them. So how could he take about 40 to 50 of the really important sight words and put them into an engaging text? And that is how Dr. Er, that is how the cat in the hat was born. So many of his works tried to do that. How do I teach writing through kind of absurd, silly, strange stories? But as you mentioned, um, his, oh, but I have to mention this too. He actually wrote a picture book for grown-ups. This is for us. This is called Your Only Old One, a book for obsolete children. And this book follows a man as he goes through endless doctor appointments and visits. He befriends the waiting, the fish in the waiting room. He ends up with a, a lot of pills that he has to take, there you go, all the pills that he has to memorize, and all the bills, the medical bills he has to pay. Uh, this is one of the last books that Dr. Seuss published before he passed away, uh, and he wrote it specifically for those in his graduating class of 1925. So he um, he definitely played with the genre as well, and I'm just to say there are children's picture books written for adults, and this is one of them. Um, but as you mentioned, Dr. Seuss isn't without his controversy. Sure. And so there's been a lot of questions um, about some of his work. When he was in college, he created um, political cartoons and some with pretty racist and offensive content. He also published a number of picture books that also um, illustrated groups of people in a way that was not respectful and did not reflect the dignity of their humanity. Dr. Seuss Enterprises has made a decision to pull some of those titles. So I think it was two years ago, in 2000, yeah, 2020 or 2021. Yeah, I think it was two years ago, um, where they actually pulled six titles and said that they will no longer be publishing those titles because of the offensive content. Dr. Seuss Enterprises has also pushed Dr. Seuss's legacy in the direction of 
uh, being Park at Universal Studios and creating a number of books and television series on CBS Kids that take some of Dr. Seuss's characters and reimagine them in this one in a board book, learning about the human body. Dr. Seuss is a really interesting case study of, you know, Theodore Geisel himself passed away 20 plus years ago, and yet his legacy and the ways in which his picture books are still published and still are part of the conversation uh, can give us uh, something to think about in terms of how do we prioritize what picture books are read and given to kids? Um, and, and also there are researchers, so Phil now is a um, Dr. Seuss scholar who wrote a picture book a couple of years ago who talked about um, Dr. Seuss's racial imagination. So again, thinking about characters, including the cat in the hat, where you see some elements of um, blackface and you see some elements of other people again being represented in, or people being represented in his work in, in you know, ways, in, in questionable and sometimes outright offensive ways. So after we go through Dr. Seuss, I have a number of students that end up writing research papers about his work. We talk about the number one most checked out book at the New York City Public Library, and that is Ezra Jack Seuss' The Snowy Day. And this book has a special place in my heart because um, I drove down to Mississippi with my mom and my two-year-old daughter, and I looked through the Ezra Jack Keith archive for over a week. Um, going through everything from a pair of underwear that fellow authors gave him when he won the Caldecott Award. Why? Still trying to figure that out. To the photographs and the paper cuttings and the, the things that have inspired him. Ezra Jack Keats, while best known for his beloved works like The Snowy Day and Goggles and A Little for Lily, um, all, like, when he started his career, he did not start wanting to be a children's fiction author. He was a capital A artist. He saw himself as with an artist soul and wanted to, you know, have sold out shows in, in studios and, and his work in museums. He started his career doing covers for mystery novels like The Chinese Box or even covers of Reader's Digest. But with some posting and some pushing, he was told that he should consider writing a children's picture book and that led to several books including The Snowy Day. He was first inspired by this series of photographs, which he found in Life magazine. It's of a little boy getting a shot, and you can see the little caption below, the child is carefree. He asks if the test will hurt. The test hurt, and he starts to cry. Trustingly, he pulls out his hand. Uh, but he saw these images and thought, hmm, like this, this is a little boy who I haven't seen in a children's picture book, and I'd like to see. And then he also thought about his own neighborhood. He lived in New York City and he thought about the children. He played on the sidewalk and he found creative ways to exist. Um, it's really interesting because uh, Margaret White Brown never had children. Ezra Jack Keith never had children. But they were really interested in how do I capture, you know, through my art, through my, my work, this world of childhood which he did through collage and through paper cutting. And he wrote this book that helped, you know, helped us follow Peter as he explores the city. He pokes at the tree covered in snow. Um, as Ohioans and Clevelanders, we can appreciate it because we will be here, no doubt, in a couple of weeks. Um, and other authors appreciate it too. We mentioned Langston Hughes earlier. Langston Hughes specifically wrote um, a letter to his editor saying that he it was perfectly charming and he wished he had some grandchildren to give it to. Um, children also took up, these pictures were taken in Cleveland. So these are taken, in, I think, the Parma Heights branch um, where children decorated um, poles and signs for the snowy day as well as one of his books called Goggles. So Ezra Jack Keith's work um, really were substantially important. And again, if you look at the New York City Public Library most checked out books, it's number one for a reason. So as I'm making an argument for why adults should read picture books. One reason is because in revisiting and looking at these, we can kind of see the world through goggles or through the glasses that Ezra Jack Keats saw during his time. 
So I just went through a lot of books, a lot of familiar topics, but I want to also share some recent favorites, some beautiful books that, um, again, are conversation starters in my classes with my engineers and my math majors, um, but also, again, as adults, can help us see the world in a new way. Um, again, you kind of asked the question, why do I, why did I focus largely on African American authors? And one of the reasons why is I'm really interested in children's picture books as a site to, um, for representational justice. And that's a term that's used by Harvard scholar Sarah Lewis, um, who has incredible work as well as she creates not picture books, but she creates lovely volumes that brings together art and photography and poetry and essays, thinking about how can we use art and architecture and photography to to have a counter narrative or counter message to some other um, imagery that we might see. Um, and I also want to point to Walter D. Myers. Um, Walter D. Myers did not write picture books. He wrote young adult literature. Um, but he also wrote a really important op-ed in 2014 called Where Are the People of Color in Children's Books? And this actually wasn't the first time he wrote an op-ed asking this question. He actually wrote something very similar in 1986, asking, I actually thought we'd revolutionize the industry. At that point, he had published 27 books, and he was celebrated for the fact that he represented African-American youth, um, but he... Um, but he kind of it, it didn't he didn't see a lot of additional work following. He didn't see more and more time, even though he was being celebrated for them. Um, and actually, I'm going to go back really quick. Like, so there's a framework that I always like to teach in my children's literature courses, and it's by a librarian named Eugene Sims Bishop. She's from Ohio State University, though emeritus now. She's retired, uh, but she talks about when we look at children's picture books. We should kind of look for three things. Um, we should look for children's picture books that are mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And what she means by that is that as readers, we should look for picture books that are mirrors. We pick up a book and we look and we see experiences that are like ours. We see communities and neighbors and families and, and ourselves in the book in some way, shape, or form. But we also need windows. We need books that we can look outside of ourselves and our experience and see the lives of someone who, who doesn't have a life like ours, whose family doesn't, who, who doesn't look like us. And then finally, we should have books that are sliding glass stores. They're somewhat reflective, there's something familiar, but something unique and different as well, and that can lead to transformation. And I think that this framework is really powerful and something that I talk about a lot with my students because in thinking of our own books and the books that we read, do we see a lot of near talk? Do we see a lot of books that are our communities or the books of people who look like us, people who have family status, like, our, like families that look like ours? Or do we see a lot of window text? We don't see a lot of picture books that near our experiences, but we see a lot of other people. Um, and that's something that when Eugene Sims Bishop, who also was writing in the 1990s, was advocating for this, there was a really large lack of diversity. Nearly 95% of children's picture books featured white children, and the remaining 5% with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when Walter D. Myers published his article in 2014, the statistics weren't far off. It was about 93% of the representation were white children, and then everybody else was about 7%. After he published this article, and unfortunately passed away several weeks later, it started a movement, the hashtag We Need Diverse Books movement, which you might have heard of or, or seen. Um, it's now a nonprofit organization that supports writers and um, and um, works of literature. Um, but I 
I think this is a really important framework, and this is an infographic made with the statistics in 2015, because it both helps us see some of the lacks or the deficits, but also what is the impact of that? What happens when you do have a lot of books that help you imagine yourself, and then what happens when you don't have money at all? And so a number of the books that I'm going to talk about try to do those different things. And the books I bring into my classroom try to provide my students, even though they're adults, with windows, mirrors, and flattened glass doors. And so here are three books that actually are Caldecott Award winners. So the Caldecott Award is given by the American Library Association for the best picture book of the year, uh, for the illustrations and the art. And these are the last three winners. They're all different and they're all incredibly beautiful and amazing. Um, the Undefeated is based on a poem that author Kwame Alexander wrote the night uh, Obama was elected for his first um, in, the, in the first year that he, for his first term. And it's a book that celebrates the Black experience, but also goes through the history and and some of the um, and some of the challenges. It ends with this beautiful picture of the artist is Kadir Nelson, who you might recognize for his work in Hindu Melissa. So this one, a couple of years ago, We Are the Water Protectors, brings in the voices of indigenous um, people who are working to protect the land. Again, told in a really strong poetic voice. This book is, is beautiful and a really important book for where we are in our world. And Watercrest tells an autobiographical story from Andrea Wang um, with art by Jason Chin. Jason Chin has written a number of picture books about the Grand Canyon, about um, like non-fiction books, which are beautiful for adults. So if you're interested uh, in kind of thinking about the Grand Canyon a different way, I'd recommend his work. But this story tells the story of a young girl who feels embarrassed by the food that her family eats, but then is told about the hardships that her parents face to come to this country and the poverty and the hunger that they experience when they live in China. And she has a new appreciation and recognition of the food. So again, this is the best, um, one of the best picture books of the year, the Caldecott, well, the Caldecott Award, and tells a really beautiful and important story. As I mentioned, I teach, uh, pre of course, specifically on narrative of immigration and children's literature. These are some of the titles that my students really like. Sea Prayer by Khalid Hussini, who wrote The Kite Runner. You might recognize that novel. Um, this is about um, uh, refugees, two white rabbits, and bright star, imagining children crossing the Mexico-U.S. border. Teacup is a little bit more Ariel, a little bit more imaginative, is about a boy who travels across the ocean uh, with a teacup full of dirt. <laughs> and it's a really beautiful take and, and thought about movement. Um, children's picture books can also be a wonderful place to discover the stories of people who aren't necessarily forgotten but aren't known. Um, this is a beautiful biography of Judith Scott, who is a woman with Down syndrome and who is deaf, who, who created art in her 40s. Um, and it, it's a really lovely story of this illustrator, again, kind of honoring her work and, and also, you know, through new art by Melissa Sweet. Um, this is another book that isn't up here, but it's a recent book about Mamie Kill Mobley, um, who lost her son on the hill. There's a movie out now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this I think it's very good. A gorgeous, gorgeous picture book that tells her story from her early years <coughs> and, and her decision um, that she made uh, in, in after her son was murdered and moving beyond. So again, this is such a moving and beautiful picture book and a way to kind of learn about this, this amazing woman in gorgeous illustrations and evil. These are also some books that my students love to talk about that I just wanted to mention. I Talk Like a River is also, um, in, in some ways, autobiographical. Uh, Jordan Scott had a stutter, and so he created this picture book about what it feels like to navigate through the world 
um, with its letter, with not being able to always produce words when you want to. And it is a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, this is one of my favorite, favorite themes. It kind of reimagines what does it mean to talk like a river. Um, and again, just beautiful, beautiful artwork by, by Sidney Smith. Um, I have two picture books that I read with my students. This one is from Germany. This one is from Norway. Both think about death and reflect on death in unique ways. My father's arm is a boat. Um, really, it takes on breathing. So it's about a young boy whose mother has died and he and his father are going through a season of grief. And one of the things I really love about this book is it doesn't end with a happy ending. So often picture books, especially for children, especially published in the United States, always try to end with a happy ending. Um, always try to end with a replacement or now you're happy. You might have started that now you're happy. This book doesn't. This book says grief can live in you and grief can be part of your life experience and, and that's okay. And it's just like a, a really beautiful way of reflecting on that. Death, death, and the two look also kind of strange, but a beautiful way to think about death and to think about, um, well, and through, I'll show you an image from it, through um, a conversation between a goose and death. Uh, how the War Changed Rondo was published um, in the Ukraine and later um, translated and published in the United States several months before the war with Russia began. And it is a incredible book that thinks about how do we introduce war to children. So again, taking on how do you introduce a topic that is so complicated and so hard, and even for adults and grown-ups, is one that's difficult to rationalize. How do you use art and story to talk about war? This is a book that my students have found really, um, really moving and a really important way to kind of think about how do we interpret and talk about war. Oh, I'll just a couple more. Um, picture books don't always have to take on hard and complex topics. These are some that are told from an adult's point of view or, okay, or a, a magical, um, elephant mouth. But they're, they're fun and they're imaginative and they're a little silly. And it's okay for picture books to, to provide that and to, to give that kind of, um, give that kind of escape to your story and art. Um, and then finally, I just want to highlight some of the, the picture books that have come out recently that are just beautiful, um, that are, I think are going to become classics or at least maybe Caldecott contenders. And these are everything from Rethinking the Mother Goose Through a Lens of Dada <laughs> Art, um, The Rock from the Sky, which imagines um, an alien and rocks falling and kind of is also this existential <laughs> book about life. Hold Them Close, which is a beautiful book. It's a love letter to black children. So it's told through photographs and mixed media, and it's just beautiful. And finally, Sophie Blackhall's Farmhouse, which tells the story of a house and a family who lived in it, and then what happens when the farmhouse is abandoned. And that's actually how Sophie Blackwell found it and when she was in front of the night book. So, I only have a couple minutes. I need to make some final arguments. And I'm actually going to quote um, a, a woman named Kathleen Rundell who wrote an entire book called Why You Should Read Children's Picture Books Even Though You Are so old and wise. Um, and I just want to pick out this closing statement that she made and expand upon it. She said, defy those who would tell you to be serious, to calculate the profit of your imagination, those who would limit joy in the name of propriety, cut shame off at the knees, ignore those who would call it mindless escapism. If not escapism, it's findism. Children's books are not a hiding place, they are a seeking place. And I really appreciate this because while I do think that there is a way we can escape a little bit in this art, in these uh, beautiful works, this idea that we can learn and discover something about 
our society, something about how we write, how we think about children, and frankly, even about ourselves is really powerful. And so, as you walk out today, you might have walked by this familiar shelf, or maybe not as familiar, right by the checkout desk. There's always a lovely display of picture books. So my challenge to you is to pause. Um, I, even if you don't have a child in your life to buy picture books for, if there is art, if there is a an image that speaks to you, pick it up. There are some wonderful and beautiful texts that are wonderful for readers of all ages, including us. So thank you so much. I have my contact information. Um, and thank you so much again for being out here today. Thank you. We have just a couple minutes for Q&A in case anyone. <laughs> and again, feel free to have a question. So thank you. Yeah, well, what's really important to is uh, interaction with parents and their children. Yeah. And that reading out loud technique really works. Yeah. And the children then, even if they're like very young, they get exposed to reading at an early age. And it's been proven theoretically, at least research has shown that they do better than when they go to preschool, PK, and they're more prepared. Yeah. You know, especially start phonics and, and the elements of language. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a, a wonderful mm -hmm. book that's called Reading with Children. Mm -hmm. uh, it's by Megan Dow Lambert. It's this idea that you can read to children, but reading with. So having a book be that um, that joining together, that way to talk about story and introduce new language and bring parents. You know, I think as a mom of three young kids, I always appreciate that because with all of the devices that sometimes steal attention or all of the things we could be doing, a book can be a centering space. It can remind us to sit down, to look at art, to look at stories. And you're absolutely right. It helps with literacy development. It helps with um, caretaker and parent relation or and child relationships. Um, it can be really, really powerful for kids. So in this presentation, I'm definitely not saying like, oh, but these aren't for kids at all. Um, but I do think that even if there's not a child, that these are beautiful works worth looking at as an adult reader as well. Um, where would you say is the cutoff point between like a picture book and a comic book? Oh, <laughs> that is such a good question. And like, I have this like this. This is The Arrival by Sean Tan. You can see it's pretty thick. And this is one that even librarians, I think, have a hard time knowing exactly where to place. It's wordless. It's all pictures, but it's over 100 pages long, and it really needs um, a lot of visual literacy to be able to understand and read. So, well, most of like when a, a book goes up to the Calica Award, the idea is that it's for an audience of ages like birth to 12. That is the range of scope that it should be directed towards. So that does mean that there's quite, quite a large amount of, of, of possibility because 12, you know, that's, middle, that's almost middle school. It's in there. Um, but comic books, too, have a different type of organization. They use the gutters. Um, and so there are definitely picture books that lean into the comic book territory and vice versa. Um, and sometimes it is hard to make those generic um, boundaries. Thank you. Um, I was just, during your presentation, I was just thinking about um, Ruby Bridges' um, children's book yeah. and just the implications of her creating that about um, her, her pursuing justice as a child to simply go to school yeah. despite apartheid. Now she's making a children's book addressing the very children who are the same age as her. Yeah. You know, um, it's such a, a powerful conversion. Absolutely. And I think that there are like a number of children's picture books that, again, like picture books writers have said, 
sometimes I write because I, I'm not, I, I know that that gap existed. So again, Walter D. Meyer didn't have books that showed him himself and his communities that he wrote it. And I think Ruby Bridges, in giving her autobiography, but also showing what her life was like, is such a powerful, is such a powerful tool, you know, for, again, both child and adult readers who are also sometimes learning her story for the first time. I'm glad that I came to this because I have this big argument with a lot of people. They think that picture books should stop at like third or fourth grade. Mm -hmm. I argue because I taught older children. They were the ones who couldn't read that well, but if you gave them a picture book, they would go for the gold. So I really feel like more picture books should be written for older children. Probably even high school, yeah. because they would appreciate it more. Yeah. And I think sometimes we, like, it takes, like, I mentioned the term visual literacy. So sometimes we really lean in on text and really knowing words and that's the most important. But art also needs to be read and interpreted. And that's something that's hard. My college students really struggle with that sometimes, especially when I give them a largely wordless picture book. How do you tell stories, create meaning, find the visual symbolism, find the motif, apply all of the literary devices but to art? And and I think sometimes, especially as you're develop as you're, you're developing reader, a kind of learning to navigate, sometimes your skills or your tools in looking at image to create stories are even stronger than some more proficient readers. And so I love that. And I'm so grateful that you mentioned that. I'm so grateful that you did that work as a teacher too. Thank you.